Precious Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us to wake up once again. We thank you for the daily mercies that you give us. Lord, help us understand, help us know that if we're here today, it's because you have us here. Father, we pray that you would speak to us through your word, that we might apply it, that we might not harden our hearts to it, that we might open up our hearts to your word. Show us, what do you want us to do? Are you telling us to stop doing something? Are you, st are you telling us today to start doing something? Lord, we pray that you speak to us today, that we might be filled anew with your Holy Spirit. Because tomorrow is another day, and we need you every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. The youth can be dismissed at this time. For you, for you guys that have just been coming back from a your winter vacations. Um, welcome back. We've been going through the Gospel of John. Uh, I titled this series, uh, Hello, I Am Jesus. Today we're in the chapter 8. We started last week. We covered uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, the infamous story of the adulterous woman. But I think it's more about the, the grace of Jesus Christ, not so much about the woman and her sin or her accusers for that matter. Just a quick recap on that. Jesus is doing a small Bible study, right? In the temple during the, maybe the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. He's sitting down teaching the people and guess who comes, right? The Pharisees. They come and they bring, they're dragging this woman. They say they found her committing the act of adultery. So you can imagine, you know, her hair is raggedy and, you know, maybe she's probably half dressed. And they interrupt the Bible study. Again, this is the infamous passage where Jesus says, you know, he who is without sin, throw the first stone. They all left, right? Jesus writes something on the ground. We don't know what it is. We can speculate with the Ten Commandments and maybe their sins as well. What we do know is that they were convicted by what Jesus said and by what Jesus wrote. We know that the Pharisees uh, really did not act upon conviction, but the woman did because she says, uh, she calls Jesus Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So he doesn't offer her cheap grace. He offers her real grace and he calls her to live a life set apart, a life for Jesus. And that's where we left off last week. Uh, this, in verse 12 of chapter 8, it might be sometime later, no more than a week, I suppose, but we can see uh, it's another conversation with the Pharisees, another conversation with the scribes and the religious leaders. I titled this message, Sunlight. Now, we have two types of light, generally. Yeah, there's lasers, there's UV lights for your uh, water systems or whatever. Um, but in essence, there's two types of light. There's the first light, right? And God said in the beginning, let there be light. And there was light, right? He called it good. That's a natural light. What we used, we have, there's different uses for light. We use it every day. I need it for my iPad, for my notes. We need it to see, right? It dispels the darkness. But interestingly enough, light can be used to heal. Light can be used as a sort of a therapy. I know when my son was born, he was born, he had jaundice, something calming among a lot of children when they're born. They're, they have too much uh, bilirubin inside of them. So they sort of put him under this, uh, this heating uh, lamp and the light sort of goes into, through their skin and through their blood and sort of gets rid of the extra bilirubin inside of them, takes away the yellowing from the eyes, the yellowing from the skin, you know, makes the, this is what we call phototherapy. Another way we can see light as a healing uh, instrument is um, when we go outside. You know, if you're vitamin D def uh, deficient, you can go outside, get some light, it'll help you out. Doctors will tell you that. I'm not diagnosed. If you're vitamin D deficient, don't just go outside and use that as your treatment only, okay? I'm not diagnosing anybody here today with that. Uh, I know it helps. There's also another in uh, funny thing. Uh, there's an acronym, SAD, which stand if you pronounce it, it's SAD, but it stands for Seasonal Affective Disorder. The Mayo Clinic defines it as a type of depression that occurs at the, time, the same time every year. If you're like most people with seasonal affective disorder, your symptoms start in the fall and may continue into the winter months. Sapping your energy and making you feel moody. Less often seasonal affective disorder causes depression in the spring or early summer. Treatment for seasonal affective disorder includes light therapy or the sun, according to the Mayo Clinic, an article on the Mayo Clinic. So we that are locals here in Yuma, we should not have an excuse to be sad because we have the sun most of the year, most all year round, right? It's barely leaving. 
I have a couple of uh, light bulb jokes. I don't know if you guys like those. Just to open up the, the sermon here. Number one, how many evolutionists does it take uh, to change the light bulb? Uh, it takes one, but over a period of millions of years. <laughs> Number two, how many, how many men does it take to change a light bulb? Zero. Real men are not afraid of the dark. <laughs> and here's another evolutionist one. Uh, how many evolutionists does it take to change a light bulb? A. None, because they're all waiting for it to evolve into an even better, longer lasting, more economic light bulb. How many Calvinists does it take to change a light bulb? None. God is predestined when the lights will go on. How many TV evangelists does it take to change a light bulb? One. But for the message of hope to continue to go forth, send in your donations today. <laughs> that's it for that. I probably have another one in the middle of the sermon somewhere. So that's the first light, right? The first light is a natural light. We use it every day. We can see it. We can feel it. It can heal. Then there's a second light. The title of this message, sunlight. The light that we can only get from Jesus Christ. Another way of saying uh, you know, you're born again. By the way, this verse, uh, verse 12, is a second I am statement. There's seven of them in the Gospel of John. In chapter 5, I believe, Jesus says, uh, I am the bread of life. Here's the second one. We're going to read in verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So that's it. That's the second I am statement. We're going to go over, what, five more? But nonetheless, he's going to say I am several other times here in this verse. And they don't count him as the I am statement. So, I like what Psalm 119, 105 says. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let's sort of diagnose this verse, verse 12 though, for a minute. I can see three things here. Uh, number one, very obvious. Who is the light? Jesus, right? Number two, if we follow him, we have the light. And the third observation here is, if we have the light, we won't walk in darkness. Let's read the verse again. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. What is darkness? Well, it's contrast there. You know, if you have the light, you're born again. You're following after Jesus, you know, fellowshipping, going to church, serving him, following him, praying, and so forth. But what is darkness? It would be the opposite. It would be a lifestyle of sin. It would be a life, a carnal lifestyle, a fleshly lifestyle. Maybe BC, before Christ, how were you in the life of darkness? We were all in the dark one day before we met Jesus Christ. So the three things. Jesus is a light. If we follow him, it's because we have the light. And third thing, if we have the light, we're not going to walk in darkness. Let's turn to John chapter 9, verse 5. Jesus says in, in John chapter 9, verse 5, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Right? As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Remember when Jesus told the disciples, I will go, but I will send the Comforter. Right? He will be with you. Talking about the Holy Spirit. Right? Because we do have the Holy Spirit, the New Testament church, which is us, the Gentiles, we are the reflectors of that light. So one observation is, okay, the world rejects the light, the church reflects the light. You know, pretty catchy, pretty simple to understand. That's one of the points I have. You know, uh, the world rejects the light, but we reflect the light. How do we do that? Well, we reflect it when we uh, share the gospel with other people. We reflect it when we do not walk in darkness. Okay? Simple stuff. See, Jesus might be in heaven, but he's entrusted us to reflect this light. And again, in Ephesians 5, 8 through 4, 14, Paul sort of emphasizes more on what it means to walk in the light, to walk righteously and follow after him. In John chapter 3, 19 and 20, I believe, it says that, this is me paraphrasing, that the reason people don't follow after Jesus is because they love the darkness, because the light reveals their sins. And those that do follow after Jesus are because the light reveals their good deeds. So if we have the light, we're going to follow after the Lord. If not, we're not. 
we're going to follow after our own flesh desires. Simple stuff, verse 12 there. If we go to verse 13 of 20, I titled uh, The Fight with the Light. Here we're going to see another argument between Jesus and uh, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Verse 13 says, The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet I do judge. My judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Verse 18, I am the one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So what's going on here is they're not accepting his testimony. They're saying, you're not really from God. We don't know who you are. You didn't go to the schools we went to. Uh, they keep uh, harassing Jesus' calling. They're denying that he came from the Father. They still don't understand what Jesus means by Father. Jesus is going to clarify in the later on verses. Something they do point out, though, by the law, that you needed to have at least two witnesses to verify wherever you came from. And Jesus is basically telling him here, I am a witness enough. In verse 18, I am the one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So you have two eternal witnesses that bear witness of Jesus himself. It's enough. Keep in mind, though, in earlier chapters, Jesus had already given him several witnesses that he brought to the stand. If you were here with us, you'd remember that one of the witnesses was Jesus' works. His signs that he did pointed to something big or something else. Nobody else could do them. That's one sign. That's one witness. Another witness was John the Baptist. What did John the Baptist do? He prepared the way for Jesus Christ. He was the forerunner, right? That's another witness. Another witness we have is the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures that they nonetheless had, right? The Jews had the Old Testament. All the prophecies contain that the prophets foretold, like Micah 5, 2. What does it say? That the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem, right? All these prophecies spoke about Jesus Christ. Those were his witnesses. And the fourth witness, which was the Father. Again, he's mentioning him here. What does God say audibly from heaven? You know, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That was witness enough. But Jesus was done giving witnesses. He just basically said, look, I'm witness enough and my Father is witness enough. And, and they're going to continue to ask him, you know, who is your Father? By the way, I think the word Father is the most word found here in this uh, chapter, chapter 8 for that matter. So you'll be hearing me repeat it. Verse 19. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Several things here. It tells us where Jesus is speaking, next to the treasury, right? It's been said that the Pharisees, you know, they, they were very pompous. They like to brag about how much money they gave. So they would come up with a bunch of shekels, and they were sort of thrown one by one, and they were clank as they hit the, the, you know, the, the offering pot or whatever. Well, this is where Jesus is speaking. And, he's, and it says that they can't get him because it's, it's not his time. As he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. He was still under the Father's time. But notice this, he's talking to everyday people here. Yeah, they're Pharisees, they, that's their job, but these guys were religious. They are people like today we can speak to and say, well, they might say, well, I give to the church. I'm okay with the Lord. I'm a tither, right? Or I'm a good person. I hold morality. I have big moral standards. Does that mean that you're saved? No. Nonetheless, words don't save us. What does Ephesians 2.8 say, right? We're saved by grace through faith, not by words, so let's none should boast. So here, Jesus is having not an unordinary conversation with somebody or these guys that are really denying who Jesus is. They're denying that he comes from the Father. And let me tell you this. If you have a calling, if the Lord calls you to do whatever, you know, whatever it is, everybody has a different calling, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter how old you are either, for that matter. If the Lord has called you, he's called you. You're supposed to do it. You know, I don't care if somebody tells you, well, you're too young. You don't have enough gray hairs on your head. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. If God's called you to do it, do it. God uses small shepherd boys. If God uses a donkey to, to talk to another man, God can use you, and he'll use anybody else for that matter. It doesn't matter. We need to get away from that perception that you need something outside of the calling. 
Here Jesus is making it obvious. He comes from the Father. Verses 21 and 36 I titled, Sunlight Sets You Free. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I go you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath, and I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. Here we see Jesus again using the contrast. In the first verse, verse 21, he says, I am going away, and you will seek me, and I will die, you will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. He's basically saying, I came from heaven, and I'm going back to heaven. When does he go back? Well, in the ascension, right? The Bible also says he'll come back the same way he left. So we're waiting for that coming back to the earth. Still yet to come. In verse 22, it says, so the Jews said, will he kill himself because he says, where I go, you cannot come. See, these guys were very sure. They are pretty sure they're going to heaven when they die. One of the beliefs under the Judaic law or Judaic, uh, maybe the Mishnah, their, their uh, extra biblical rules, was that people that committed suicide would go to a different compartment in hell where it was, it was a little bit uh, hotter. So they would be separate from the rest of the people in the lake of fire. And they're saying, they're basically telling saying Jesus is going to hell, and Jesus is telling him, no, I'm going to heaven where I came from. You guys are headed there because you're going to die in your sins. Verse 23, and he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. And in verse 24, we have another power verse that sort of brings in the whole context here. He says, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now let's look, at, let's look at this verse a little bit closer. In your Bible, you might have italics around the word he, and the reason for that is because it's not found in the original Greek text. I have a, uh, an image here. I should have probably zoomed in more. But in the original, there is no he. The he is added onto your English Bibles to make it more understandable. In the original, it says, you know, if ever for no, ye should be believing that I am, ye shall be from dying, ye shall be dying. Basically what it says here. If we read it in English, for if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Who is the I am? It's God, right? The ego, a, me, and Greek. He's giving another uh, statement of his deity here. And it's not the first one he's going to give in this chapter. So if you want the whole context, stick with us and you'll see. Pay attention. Verse 25, they still didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. Then they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you, sh then you will know that I am, there's a he again in italics, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me. I speak these things, <clears throat> and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. You know, I wish I could say that. I always do those things that please him. And none of us here can really say that. If you, if you say that, you're, you're either lying or you're pretty ignorant, because we all fall short, right? We're all sinners. We fall short from the glory of God. Nonetheless, he calls us to follow after him, right? Jesus is the only one that can say that. Jesus follows him perfectly. That's why, uh, and if you were here last week, when Jesus said, you know, he who, has, he who is without sin cast the first stone, Jesus was the only one in that, in that arena there with all the people around him, his disciples, the, the audience, the Pharisees, the scribes, the woman. He was the only one that could rightly judge her because he had no sin, right? Yet he decides to give grace. Again, Jesus is the one that follows the Lord perfectly. Like the song says, you know, what you do, I do. What you pray, I pray. That's our will. That's our desire. Verse 30 says, As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Another powerful verse there. Verse 31, though, at the beginning, it says, Jesus said to those Jews who believe. There's another area of groups here, or another uh, group of people here, that are now believing. During this whole conversation, this whole, maybe you might call it an argument, regardless, there's people that are coming to salvation. They're coming to the light because of Jesus' words, because of Jesus' uh, 
reflection of words between the other man here. So some, they're going to harden their heart more. They're going to reject the light. Others are going to accept the light or reflect the light eventually as well after they accept them, right? So if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Abiding in God's word. That's a test. Are you abiding in God's word? Here's a homework for you guys. This week, ask somebody, you know, how do you know you're going to heaven? Somebody might tell you, whoa, in 1983, I went to a Billy Graham crusade, and I stood up and accepted the Lord, or I got baptized at so-and-so church, right? And some might say a better answer, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, da-da-da, I accepted him. But I, I would like another answer that I think is better is because I keep on growing in his word. I keep on growing. I have a hunger, desire to follow after Jesus Christ. And that's a real evidence. You know, it doesn't matter if you start late or not. Where are you today? Are you following after Jesus today? I don't care if you accepted him 20 years from now. I'll, I'll go. Where are you today? Are you following? Is there any evidence of that action so many years ago? That's a real test of truth. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I was talking to a co-worker the other day. Um, she approached me, and she's like, I heard you're a pastor. I was like, yeah. And then, and then I asked her, well, are you a Christian? And she said, uh, yes. I've been going to a church here in Yuma for uh, a lot of years. I asked her, oh, yeah, what church are you going to? And she told me the church. And I happened to know several people from that church that are involved in the church. And, and I started just throwing names at her. She didn't know anybody from that church. So if, if, if somebody that's not from your church knows more people from your church um, than you, you are either lying and not going to church or you're not really plugged in. You're not, as it says here, abiding in God's word there and just growing in the fellowship. So we have to, we have to watch out for that. If we're abiding in God's word, there's going to be fruit. There's going to be evidence. I can't guarantee anybody's salvation here. You guarantee it yourself when you look at your fruit in your life. Verse 33 says, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we will be made free? Now they were wrong with that statement as well because they were under whose bondage? The, the Romans, right? The Romans were over them at this time. As before, we have the Greeks, uh, the Persians, right? The Babylonians, the Assyrians, and so forth. Now it was the Romans and they were definitely in bondage. They didn't understand that Jesus was speaking about sin though. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave a sin. Here this word in the Greek, commit, is a present active verb. What that means is that it's not just, okay, whoever committed sin or whoever commits one sin. It's talking about a continual practice of sin. If you are practicing sin, right, if that's an ongoing thing, not a, okay, a bump in the road here and now as Christians, we all do that. He's talking about practicing sin here, if you continue to miss the mark on a regular basis with no real desire to repent, he's saying you're a slave of sin. Verse 35, and a slave, the word doulos is used there, does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus is trying to sort of bring about the point. Look, you become part of God's household when, the, when you receive the son. Let me give you a Three illustrations about sin and the bondage of sin. Number one, there's a woman, she goes to a grocery store, right? I don't know where, where this grocery store is at because uh, it's not a normal grocery store. At Walmart, you won't go and find a, uh, a bunch of birds tied to the pole, right? They don't sell birds, uh, I believe, there. I know they sell goldfish. Anyway, she goes to the, the store and she sees a bunch, sort of a, like a tetherball pole, with no tetherball, just a bunch of quail just walking on the ground, tied up maybe to some fish string. Well, anyway, this woman sees these, these, uh, these quail, these birds, and they're just walking around in circles, and she tells the man in the store owner, I want to buy these birds. And the guy's like, okay. And she's like, get a pair of scissors on your way, you know, on your way back. So she, he brings the scissors, the woman cuts the, the quail loose, but the quail do not fly away. They keep walking in circle. When Jesus says here, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed, he's basically shoving them and telling them, look, if you're free, you're free indeed. There's no reason to remain in your sin. There's no reason to walk or revolve around your past sins, right? As Christians, we def live defeated lives because we still think we're living under the rules of the old man. We're, we're no longer in sin. That's if you're a born-again Christian. I don't want to give you any excuse if you're not saved here today. Let me give you another example. 
There's a story about two dukes or two kings. They went after each other. They had war. They, well, they both had their own men. They both had their own armies. One of them obviously was a victor. What he did is he spared his brother. He made a house inside of his, the, the castle there, and he had his brother there. Interesting thing about the house, though, is that he didn't build any doors in it. The brother was overweight, so he's like, well, if he wants to get out, he's going to have to lose some weight. Well, what he did, though, is he kept bringing servants with pastries, desserts, and this and that. The brother could have gotten out in, short, in a short amount of time if he wanted to. But because he was addicted to these pastries, to this and that, he never got out because he wanted to continue to walk around that pole like, like the birds. Another example, if you guys remember uh, Houdini, you guys remember him? Well, one of the things that he did was whenever he went to a small town or wherever he was passing by through, uh, he would contact the local sheriff or the jailer. And he would try to show off by saying, I can escape from any jail, uh, jailhouse there is. So he tried it into this one small town. They lock him up. He starts taking out his little, I don't know, crowbar and different things to sort of cut the, uh, the metal there. And he's unable to. He's, he's exhausted. He starts crying. Um, and he sort of starts just laying back. And he lays back on the door. And the door opens. The door was never locked. The jailer comes back and he says, look, I forgot to lock the door. The, lo the door has been opened for us. Okay? We do not need to live in sin anymore. Okay? We're born again, right? If you are, for that matter, again. <clears throat> Verse 37 of 51, I titled The Paternity Battle. We're going to talk about two different fathers here. It's like, we're, it's like watching a Mari show, right? I am not the father, right? And then and, and the test come in and, and the guy is the father. Verse 37 says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Verse 40, But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. So basically they're boasting about being from the lineage of Abraham. What they didn't understand is to be really in the lineage of Abraham, you have to be a believer. You have to believe like Abraham. Abraham's work was belief. Yeah, you come from Abraham. They're fleshly descendants of Abraham, except they missed the part where they have to believe like Abraham. They didn't believe in, in God. They didn't believe in the Messiah, as we see here. They were religious. They went to church every Sunday or Saturday, their Sabbath. Uh, they went to on church on Saturday, the temple. But that didn't make them any more Abraham descendants than not, because they didn't believe. It always goes back to that belief. What do you believe? You do the deeds of your father. And here they sort of insult him. They insult his mother by what they do. They, you know, one thing you shouldn't do to another man, unless you know you want to get hurt, is insult their mother. They're, when they say right here, we were not born of fornication, we have one father, God. They nonetheless heard the, the rumor, which would have, might have been by now going on for over 30 years, that Jesus, uh, Mary, was not really a virgin when she uh, had Jesus. They didn't believe that the Holy Ghost came upon her and, and uh, she had uh, the Son, Jesus Christ. They denied the virgin birth, and they're insulting Jesus with that by saying he was born in fornication. Verse 42 says, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. And it goes back to that, you know. If you're born again, you're going to understand the Bible. The veil is going to go off. It's going to come off. I remember when I was younger, B.C., before Christ, I would, you know, the only time I opened the Bible was when I got in trouble. I didn't get out of juvenile court till I turned 18 years old. When I was there, I would open the Bible all the time. I didn't understand it. Why? Because I had a veil. I just wanted to sort of do something for the Lord. Lord, let me out. Let me get some brownie points with God, right? I, he, he didn't let me out because of that. I eventually accepted the Lord. Guess what happens? I have a desire. I have a new will to go to church, to read the Bible, and to understand it. They didn't understand it. They didn't have that will because they had not come to God first. That's why he tells them in verse 43, Why do you not understand my speech? You're not able to listen to my word. They can't obey it. I like what James McDonald said. I mentioned this in my uh, maybe last week or my Wednesday service. But James McDonald says, 
When you tell your kids, go and wash the dishes or go and throw the trash, you fill in the blanks, and, and you come back and they haven't done it, you're not going to tell them, why didn't you hear me? Right? You're going to tell them, why didn't you listen to me? Implying not that they heard, but they, they, that what they heard didn't go down to the feet. So if you hear and it doesn't go down to your feet, you're not really listening. So that's what we mean by that, right? We don't mean, oh, why didn't you hear me? We mean, why didn't you obey what I said? Again, they were not obeying the words of God. Verse 44 again, you are of your father the devil, and your desires are of your, are, are of your father that you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now we know who, the, who Jesus was talking about all this time. Your father, my father, your father. This paternity test here, right? He calls them sons of the devil. Now I would recommend when you, if you guys are married and you argue, you argue with your wife, don't ever say that she's an emissary of the devil. That is not going to go well. But I have seven signs of how we today as Christians might act like the devil, might pretend to act like the devil. Number one, when we lie. Why? Because he's the father of lies, right? Number two, when we hate other people in our heart. What does Jesus call that? Murder, right? Number three, when we instigate. Maybe you're at work, you're next to the coffee machine, you're talking, gossiping, one thing leads to another. You start instigating one, one person to another, right? We start starting fights. Number four, which is pride. How does Satan fall? Pride came before the fall. Another way we can act like the devil is when we disobey. He disobeyed by taking one-third of the heavenlies with him. Number six, when we twist the word to our advantage. What did he do with Eve, Eve in the garden? He said, did God really say, and he sort of twisted around a bit, sort of to uh, you know, have her give in to, the, to eating the forbidden fruit there. When we twist the word to our advantage, I used to do that a lot with my wife when, when uh, we were younger. I would say, well, the Bible says you got to submit to me, right? As unto the Lord. And I would, when she didn't know, well, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church, right? So, you know, when we do that, we act like the devil. We're, t we're twisting the word to our advantage. And number seven, which we, a lot, a lot of us really skip. We really don't, don't uh, if you don't, didn't know this one, you're going to know it today. When we don't mind the things of God, we act like the devil. Let me explain. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, we see a conversation that Jesus has with Peter. Keep in mind, Peter is already standing behind Jesus. So he's not speaking literally, get uh, behind me. He's trying to focus on something else. Jesus tells him in the previous verse, I'm going to die. I need to die for the world. That's why I came, right? Peter's like, no, you're not going to die, Jesus. Jesus tells him, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Why did he call him Satan? He tells us because he didn't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. When your desires are just fleshly, are just the world, just your job, just your work and back, that's it. When you put Jesus, as some say, and the co-pilot and not the driver, you're basically, you know, I think you're acting like the devil. You're not putting Jesus first. You put him in the back seat. Regardless if he's the co-pilot or not, he's not driving your boat. He's not driving your life. Colossians 3 tells us a little bit more. Paul says, if then you were raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Let's continue here, verse 45. But because I tell, you the, I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Another powerful verse, verse 47. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. The, New Living, the, the Living Bible renders this verse like this. Anyone whose father is God listens gladly to the words of God. Since you don't, it proves you are in his children. In other words, like I said before, if belief doesn't follow, if uh, evidence doesn't follow your belief, there's a problem, right? We need to examine ourselves. It's like Paul says, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. It's like James says, you know, show me your, your, your faith and I'll show you my faith by my works. Faith without works is dead. It's harsh but true, you know. I've been judged for saying the same thing that Jesus is basically saying in verse 47. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, if you don't hear God's word, you're not of God. That would be pretty judgmental in the age we have today of tolerance, right? Everybody is tolerant. of You're right. He's right. Everybody's right. Except if you say an absolute like Jesus is the only way, 
you're wrong. You're being intolerant. This verse, verse 47, would be something very offensive. You know, but it's okay because the word of God is what offends, not, not anything else. It's God's word, and, that, and that's very okay because the light is going to shine and cause people to either react to it or not. As they say, the same hot water that softens the inside of a potato will harden the inside of, a, of an egg. There's different hearts out there. We need to make sure we put out that light, that hot water out there. First John 2.6 says, he, will, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Now to finish up the chapter here in verse 48, Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? First they're talking about his mama. Now they're saying he's demon-possessed. Verse 49, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Like the great paradox, born once, die twice, born twice, die once, right? If you believe in Jesus Christ, though you may die, you will live again. I have an interesting, uh, not divine appointment, but sort of, I know this was just right for this time. I listen to Chuck Smith, the late Chuck Smith, of course, whether it's in the car, if I listen to him in the car, or his commentaries at home, whatever. Chuck Smith has a little comment on this last verse here, verse 51. Let's go ahead and read it. He that keeps my saying will never see death. Chuck says, I believe that. I believe that completely. I believe that one day my consciousness will leave this body and people will read in the paper, Chuck Smith died. That's poor reporting, inaccurate to say the least. To accurately record, they must write, Chuck Smith moved out of a decrepit, worn-out tent into a beautiful new mansion. I won't be dead. I'll be very much alive <clears throat> there in the presence of God in his eternal kingdom. Chuck Smith, you know, just for this time. Right? Just perfectly set in for this message. You know, Chuck is now gone. When he wrote this, he wasn't gone. But very perfectly said, you know. He is out of this body. But to be out of this body is what? To be in the presence of who? Lord, right? John 11, 25, 26 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Again, it goes back to belief in the Lord. Shedding light, verse 52. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar just like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Jesus is telling him, Look, I know, I know Abraham. I used to kick it with him back in the day. He appeared with Abraham, right? How? Christophany, theophany. When Jesus appears in the Old Testament, right? As the angel of the Lord, maybe. Or as a priest, Melchizedek, with, uh, with Abraham. Maybe one of those instances was, was he's referring to here. It's interesting, though, when, uh, when uh, Abraham was interceding to the Lord, to the angel of the Lord there, to sort of save Lot and his family. Remember that? What if there's ten? Will you spare them? Remember that? Well, you have the angel of the Lord there. You have the two angels that go in. Those are straight out, just regular angels. But then you have the angel of the Lord on the outskirts just watching, waiting to pour down fire and brimstone. You know, I believe, that's my opinion, that was Jesus Christ, a Christophany there, judging Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe that's what Jesus is referring to here. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Verse 57, Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. Keep in mind, Jesus was 33 years old at this time. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, here's the other uh, deity statement, Before Abraham was, I am. Is there a he there? No, there's no he. He just basically says, I am. They understood it. They understood what he meant. Verse 59 says, Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Later on, if you, let me have you guys turn to John chapter 10 real quick before we finish up. John chapter 10, verse 31, they're going to sort of find him again. He sort of slips away right now, but they still have their stones in their hands. It's interesting how last message, they left and they dropped their stones. Here, Jesus left and they, got, they still have their stones in their hand. 
Anyways, they meet up with Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 31. What does it say? Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. If you want to know the interpretation of the passage there, the context tells us that when Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am, in verse 58, he was declaring to be God right there. You know, when Moses was, God spoke to Moses during the burning bush, Moses said, who do I tell him sent me? God said, tell him that the I am sent you. I am that I am sent you. That's God's name. Jesus is saying he is God here. These guys understood it. We can understand it. If your friendly Jehovah's Witness doesn't understand it, that's his problem, right? We have to take the word for what it says. Don't take it out of context. It was a long chapter, but we finished it up. We have a, a video clip we're going to play for about Chuck Smith real quick. Let's close up in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, because you've allowed us to get through another chapter. Help us, Lord, to teach the word simply. Simply teach simply was Chuck's motto. We pray, Lord, that we might be faithful to that, be faithful to just being at your feet. Help us now to, to worship you, Lord, in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name. Let's turn back to number six. For a long time, I've been wanting us to learn this course that uh, Crystal taught us tonight uh, as sort of a, uh, a departing kind of a chorus. I think it's beautiful, you know, as sort of a conclusion to the service and departing from one another to pronounce this blessing of God upon each other. And uh, I don't know if Crystal's still here, but if she is, she can probably help me. I don't think I know this chorus, but I, I, I think I can start it if you can finish it. Ah, all right, Crystal. I'll, I'll sing the after part. Okay. No, tell you what. Let the men sing the first, the Lord bless you, and let the women echo it. And keep you, the women echo it. And... Uh, then we all sing together those other parts. So men, join with me. Women, join with Crystal. And then we'll all sing those parts together. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his, his face, face to shine upon thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. Once more, and this will be our benediction. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. Countenance, his countenance upon thee.